Father, this morning we come to you, and you know our deepest needs. You've watched our victories. You've seen our defeats. This morning we come here humbled to be in your presence, aware that you and you alone can meet those needs. Father, sometimes we just have to say, help me, Lord. Sometimes we just have to come to that place in acknowledging that our pride has kept us from extending our hand to you. And so this morning, we just want to be genuine. We just want to be real before you. We just come into your presence, thanking you for inviting us, and pray, Father, that you would accomplish what you want to do in our lives individually and congregationally. We thank you, Father, that we have this facility to come and worship you in. We thank you that we worship with others who are in the journey with us. Father, you're not asking us to be perfect, to get everything completely together and then show up. You just invite us to come as we are and then allow you to do what you want to do. And so, Lord, we give you permission to do whatever you want to do in and through us this morning for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? The shame's done on the ceiling, and you're desperate for the sweetening. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Because I've stated it hundreds of times. I believe the meaning of life can be summed up in a single word, and that word is what? Relationship. <laughs> You're so good. <laughs> <laughs> We've been created for relationship with God and relationship with one another. I mean, to set the context, God the Father created us for relationship. God the Son sacrificed his life to restore that relationship with the Father because it had been ruined because of our sin. 
And God the Holy Spirit dwells within us so that we may maintain that relationship with the Father. And so when we find ourselves in an abiding relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then and only then can we truly have a healthy relationship with one another. But, but let me ask you this. How many of you have discovered relationships can be messy? <laughs> Just a few of you? Then you haven't lived long enough. Okay? I'm not asking who it's messy with. I'm just, relationships can be messy. And, and you know what makes them messy? Sin. All of us are flawed. All of us sin. We, we disobey the standard of God. And that affects not only our relationship with God, but our relationship with one another. And what makes relationships the messiest is when we do not biblically respond to sin. And that's what I want to address this morning. Because we, too, we go off, too often we go to one of two extremes. When there's sin, disobedience to God, we condemn the sinner. We judge the sinner. That's one extreme. The other extreme is we just ignore the sin. So we, we, we typically go, we're either going to judge and condemn the person who sinned, or we're just going to look the other way and ignore the sin. And neither extreme is healthy, especially in a church family. And that's why I want us to address the issue of relationships, but specifically responsibility and restoration in relationships. Well, as I said, we were created to have a relationship with God and relationship with one another. Therefore, we, we need to understand that when a brother or sister in the church family is struggling with sin, which we all do at times, we need to know how to properly respond. Because judging and condemning the sinner is not biblical, and ignoring the sin is not biblical. And so Paul's going to help us this morning, but, but I want to make sure we're all starting with the same foundation. And that is the definition of sin and the types of sin. The definition of sin, sin is a violation of God's standard. Sin is a violation of God's word. Sin is a, stand, is, is a violation of God's law. So when we define sin, we know it to be a violation of the standard of God. Not the standard of man but the standard of God. That's sin. Whether it's intentional or not is not so much the issue. Sin is sin. Different consequences, but sin is a violation of the standard of God. And there's really only two types of sin. There's the sin of commission, that being we do what we should not do. We're committing a sin. But do you also realize that there's the sin of omission, and that is not doing what we should do? In the book of James, he says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So we have sins of commission, sins we, we actively disobey God. And we have sins of omission, that there is something we should do, but we choose not to. So when that happens, and it happens, how do we respond to that? Well, I hope you realize I'm talking to all of you. From the youngest to the oldest, regardless of gender, education, economic standard, please understand this message is for every single one of you, because from God's perspective, you are all sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. So Paul teaches us that all of us are sinners. But in every group, somebody feels like they are the exception. <laughs> they are the special one. Well, if you feel like you're the exception, here's what John the Apostle says. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, 
and his word is not in us. But the good news, John then says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So now that we know we're all in this together, how do we properly, properly and biblically deal with sin? It's not to condemn the sinner, nor is it to ignore the sin. Turn in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Galatians. We're continuing our verse-by-verse study in the book of Galatians. We're in the sixth and final chapter. And I'm going to address a verse that I'm guessing most of us have misunderstood and misapplied. Because I know I have. And my guess is, we've heard this verse in the midst of this passage, and we've thought it meant something it didn't mean. So I'm going to preach from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, responsibility and restoration in relationships. And as is our tradition, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bury one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinketh himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So Paul began this letter in a very cold, formal manner. But as he's been writing the letter, his tone has changed. And we know that because he addresses them with this very affectionate term, brethren. Chapter 1, verse 11, and, and chapter 3, and chapter 4. He's reminding them that they are brothers and sisters in Christ because of their faith in Jesus. And especially in light of what he's about to say, he says, brethren, if a man, and, that, and that's a generic term, man, woman, child, adult, if a man be overtaken in a fault, it conveys the idea of somebody caught, not in the actual act of sinning, but it's as, it's as if sin was chasing them down and caught them, overtook them. I like how Pastor Chuck Swindoll kind of paints this picture. He says, the language implies that the sinner, through weakness, has gotten himself or herself snared by the lures of this world. Now, do not misunderstand. The sinner is not a victim. But it's as if sin was, was approaching them and overtook them. But they're not a victim. They're still responsible for their sinfulness. But they're not speaking to the person who's openly defiant against God who's in open rebellion against God. No, he's speaking to you and I who are doing the best we can, yet sometimes we succumb to temptation. Sometimes in the midst of temptation, we turn our back against God and fulfill what Paul said earlier, the desires of our flesh. And Paul's words are a reminder that at any stage of life, we can sin. At any season of our lives, we are susceptible to being overtaken by sin. And when that happens, he then speaks to the rest of us. You that are spiritual, please do not misunderstand this idea of being spiritual. He's speaking to those who have received the Spirit at the point of salvation, Romans chapter 8. And those who are walking in the Spirit, Galatians 4.16, those who are spiritually mature, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. This word restore is a medical term. 
It conveys the idea of somebody who's broken a bone, and that bone has been set again to heal and to return to its original condition and function. It's also used as a fishing term to mend or to repair the nets. It conveys this idea of returning something to its original condition, its original purpose. And what is our original purpose? Well, we are called to exalt God, to glorify God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, wherefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do to the glory of God, exalt him, glorify him. That's what God created you. In that relationship with him, in that relationship with others, you bring glory to God. And so when sin has happened in the life of a brother or sister, you who have received the Spirit and are walking the Spirit as mature believers, come alongside and restore them and do it in the spirit of meekness, gentleness, humility. Not in a proud, arrogant manner. Not to look down on them and just say, not there. Not to convey that you are better and superior than they are, but to come alongside in gentleness and in humility and in meekness. And then he provides this warning at the end of verse 1, consider yourself lest you also be tempted. I like how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 10. Wherefore let him that think he stand take heed lest he fall. Just when you, when you think you have it all together, watch out. That's why humility, not thinking more highly of ourselves, is so critical. And so he sets the tone. The tone and the context is this. A brother or sister in the body of Christ is struggling with sin. Your responsibility is to come alongside them and restore them. Help get them back to where they need to be and do so in all humility. And then he says, verse 2, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And I've heard this verse used so often, but out of context. Well, we're called to bear one another's burdens. Yes, we are. But Paul is talking about the context of sin. Burdens references the ongoing temptations that a believer may be struggling with. And remember, it's not a sin to be tempted. Christ was tempted. But continual temptations can become a heavy burden. And how many of you, without raising your hands, know that the enemy loves to attack where you're the weakest? The enemy is not stupid. If you have a particular weakness, that's where the enemy loves to attack. And so our responsibility is to come alongside and bear one another's burdens to help them, to encourage them, never to compromise by accepting their sin, but to encourage them to move beyond that temptation, move beyond that sinfulness, and get back to where they can glorify God. And when we do that, he says, we fulfill the law of Christ. You know what the law of Christ is? Love one another. That's what he said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 13, a new commandment I give unto you, that you do what? Love one another. And sometimes loving one another means that you put your arm around somebody and say, you know what? What you're doing is not right. What you're doing is not honoring God. Let me help you get back to what God created you to do, and that's bring glory to Him. That's hard. But when we approach each other in humility and meekness, it's amazing how receptive others can be. But he provides this warning in verse 3. If a man thinks himself to be something, in other words, the idea of pride, the idea of arrogance, especially when you've, when you've come along with somebody who is, who is struggling and you help them, 
It's so easy to compare yourself to them. It's so easy to think, yeah, man, I'm glad I'm not where they are. Lord, I'm glad I'm not struggling with they are. He says, look at if you think yourself to be something when he is nothing, you deceive yourself. Understand who you are in God. Jesus teaches a wonderful parable about this in, in John chapter 15, excuse me, Luke chapter 17. But, but this idea of pride and arrogance is, is really at the core of sin. When we think more highly of ourselves, when we compare ourselves. I, I see this all the time in athletics. Whether it's a football field, basketball court, volleyball court. Students, especially at the level that I coach, and I'm guessing Kevin would say the same thing at the level he coaches, it's so easy to compare yourself to others. They're better, or I'm better. I have more ability. They have more ability. And we live in a society that loves to compare itself, and guess what? That's coming to the church. We begin to compare ourselves with one another. We, we place ourselves on this hierarchy. I, I'm glad I'm not down that low, but I, I, there, there, there's somebody that's a little bit more mature than I am. Guess what? There's always going to be people more mature and less mature than you. There's always going to be people that are better than you and not so much. But you have responsibility for who? Yourself. Focus on where you're at in your journey and consider it a privilege to come alongside others in the midst of their journey. So much so that he says in verse 4, let every person prove or test themselves. This is a theme throughout Paul's writing. Let a man examine himself, 1 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Let me give you three questions to help you examine yourself, to, to test yourself. And I'm guessing these may sound familiar. Am I exalting God, edifying others, and extending the kingdom? That's a great test. One that you at Community Bible Church are familiar with. Here's a second question. Am I obeying the two great commands, loving God and loving others? Maybe a third question. Is Jesus my greatest passion? You've heard all of those questions before because those are our three purposes. Those are the two great commands of Scripture and that is to be our singular passion. Means by which we can honestly evaluate where we are in our journey. Once again, I said evaluate yourself. Not ask those questions of somebody else to evaluate them. And he says, then you'll have rejoicing in yourself. It's not that, once again, it's not about pride, it's not about arrogance, it's not about saying, hey, look at me. But when God is working in you, that's an exciting place to be. When you've seen growth in your life, you don't put it on Facebook. You don't go to social media and say, hey, i got to tell you how good I'm doing. <laughs> Well, you might, but that's not what I'm encouraging. <laughs> no. But you can have confidence that God is working in your life. God is changing your life. That's exciting. When you're making progress in your spiritual journey, it's not about posting it on social media, but it's about thanking God that he's working in you for his glory. And then Paul says this. Remember, verse 2, what did he say? Bear one another's burdens. Be willing to carry that burden for somebody else. And then verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> this is one of those passages people love to say, see, there's a contradiction. Verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. Verse 5 says, bear your own burden. See, the Bible contradicts itself. How can you trust the Bible? Let's get rid of it. No, the Bible does not contradict itself. What is unfortunate is our English translation uses the same word in both verses. 
But the New Testament was written primarily in a different language, Greek. And there's two different words used here. If you look into a Strong's Concordance, you can see two different words. In verse 2, it speaks of a heavy load that would typically be carried by a ship. That's the weight temptation and sin places on people. But in verse 5, it speaks of a much lighter load that one would carry in their own backpack. Two completely different concepts. Here's how one author describes this. Though these two words are basically synonymous in other contexts, the change in nouns here indicates a change in reference. And here's the difference. Verse 2 refers to the need to come to the aid of others who cannot carry the crushing burden of the consequences of sin. Verse 5 refers to the work given to us by our master before whom we will give an account of how we've used the opportunities and talents he's given us to serve him. Same English word, but different words in the original language, which conveys verse 2, when somebody is weighed down by a load so big that it would need a ship to carry, help them. But also understand the light load that God has given you, carry your own load. Be faithful. And then finally in verse 6, heavy breath is to indicate there's two interpretations to verse 6. I'm going to share both and let you wrestle with them. He says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. There's two schools of thought what Paul is saying. One interpretation says that because the word communicate literally means fellowship, we, the one teaching and the one being taught, so let's use the context of this morning, I'm teaching, you're being taught, that we are to encourage one another. We are to come alongside of one another. We are to have fellowship with one another. That's one possible interpretation. There's a second interpretation that says the one being taught in the word, that being you, should share and support the one that does the teaching. And Paul addresses this in 1 Timothy chapter 5 when he talks about that financial relationship within the church. Two possible interpretations. Let me say this. As pastor of Community Bible Church, I've been the recipient of both. I've been the recipient of your incredible encouragement, and I've been the recipient of your faithful support. So in both ways, you as a congregation have fulfilled Galatians 6.6. 6. So where does that bring us this morning with these six verses? I'm going to give you two two-word applications. Keeping it simple. Because the context is somebody struggling with temptation and sin, the first two-word exhortation I give to you is be helpful. Be helpful. That's action. Because when we fulfill the one another's in the Bible, it means neither to judge the sinner nor to ignore their sin. It means to come alongside. It means to do what Jesus did to the woman caught in adultery. When we read that story, it concludes with Jesus saying to her, neither do I condemn thee. So he's not judging and condemning. But then he says this, go and what? Sin no more. He doesn't judge and condemn her, but he doesn't ignore her sin. We are called to be helpful to one another, especially when that person is struggling with temptation and sin. Be helpful. That's your action. With every action comes an attitude. Here's your attitude. Be humble. Turn to the book of James, and I'll conclude with this this morning. Turn to James chapter 4. It's after the book of Hebrews. Some of you are looking at me like, thanks, Rob, that just solved everything. 
just helping you find things. Look with me in James chapter 4, and I, and I want you to see this with your own eyes. Because this idea of an attitude of humility is so critical. James chapter 4, verse 6. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. This idea of humility. Peter picks up on this. Don't turn there. But Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In that song we sometimes sing in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to what? Walk humbly in his sight. So what Paul is saying here in our responsibility in relationships, be helpful to one another. Do not condemn the sinner and do not ignore the sin. That's your action. And your attitude, be humble. Be filled with humility. Because while today you may be the one helping, tomorrow they may be the one helping you. Be helpful, be humble, let's pray. Father, I thank you for just the clarity of your word. We are all facing challenges of temptation and sin. But Father, what we are promised in the word, or at least what we're encouraged in the word, is that brothers and sisters have been called to come alongside those struggling. It may not always be in the most convenient of times. It may be even difficult and uncomfortable. But if we truly care for one another, if we truly love one another, we will reach out when we see somebody struggling. And in all humility, come alongside them. Encourage them, pray for them, and help carry that burden for them. That they may know that they're not alone. Father, would that we as a church be described that way. That in our relationships, we seek the very best. We seek to bring glory to our Father which is in heaven. Father, this can be quite challenging because it's so easy for us to justify not saying or doing anything because we're not perfect. Paul says, it's not about being perfect. It's about being helpful. Father, give us the courage to build those relationships in which we can come alongside one another and make a difference in their lives for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.
want to encourage you to uh, take the opportunity to visit with Chad and Andrea while they're here. Uh, a lot of food has been prepared for you on this final Sunday of the month. We have an after church fellowship in our foyer. Just to encourage you not to feel like you need to hurry off. Um, so appreciative of our own family who provide that every month for us. Amen. It's interesting. They'll know, they being the world, will know we are Christians. We profess to follow Jesus. Why and how? Because of our love for one another. And our love for one another is evident at the risk of being repetitive is that because we're not condemning one another, we're coming alongside one another. We're not ignoring sin, but we're encouraging the sinner to turn from that sin. And just as others need that encouragement, so will you at some point in your journey, I promise you. Let me come back to the words that I just spoke from Micah. He has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord requires of you. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly in his sight. May that be your testimony.